There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long.
Ashley prophecies fulfilling and signs of the times that appear. scripture today comes from Matthew chapter number 28 and also Acts chapter number 1. Before we get there, I would like to just do a little introduction. I tell you, we sing that song and, and you know, just tears well up in, in my eyes. I don't know about yours. I've, you know, I just imagine that that time, you know, when will I be here? Or will I be one of those that rise from the grave? It really doesn't matter, I don't guess, but kind of like the Apostle John, come Lord Jesus, come. But as we even make that statement, we have to realize that we're still here. Jesus is still on his throne. The church age is continuing to move and go. And we have to follow the words of Jesus that I mentioned as I was praying earlier in Matthew chapter number 24, verses 6 through 8. I want to share this with you first. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these things, all, all, of, all these are the beginning of sorrows. I think sometimes we don't hear Jesus quite correctly or clearly. Jesus' words indicate that his church during such times as these, we are to in, during such times as w in, that we're living in right now. Though we, we sing and, and we wait for that time and, and we look for that time and God's word teaches us to anticipate the time of his return and to, to call Lord Jesus come. But as we're calling Lord Jesus come, 
We don't need to sit down and we're not supposed to sit down and we're not supposed to climb some mountain or we're not supposed to go down into some cave and just sit and wait for that time to check out. Jesus' church during these times, my friends, we need to be doing more of a checkup. We need to do a checkup on our faith and, and resolve in our hearts. Are we ready to endure all these things that must come to pass? My friends, we see it happening over now in the Ukraine. But we're not so ignorant, I hope, as to understand that with all the technology that has been allowed to come about in this world in this day and time, that we're not from, we in this nation are not out of the reach of such things happening here. Are we ready to resolve? Are we done a checkup? That we're prepared to endure all these things that must come to pass. As you continue to worship and continue to praise and continue to exalt the Lord God before others, I, I don't know if you've watched any of the videos of some of the Christians that have posted things online over these last few days from the Ukraine and just listen to them and their resolve and their faithfulness to trust the Lord and to praise Him and exalt Him even in the midst of what's going on in their country. We need to do a checkup of the church's faithfulness and the church's resolve to take into our community the hope of the gospel message of Jesus Christ first and foremost. We need to do a checkup in our church and the preparedness to then provide for the survival you know, I, 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 people forget about history. But man, you go back a hundred years ago. Do y'all realize what was coming into being in this nation a hundred years ago? Who remembers? You don't remember. Who knows from their history? <laughs> well, Faye, I'm not sure how old you were at that time. But I don't know if you actually remember. What was beginning to happen? The Great Depression. World War I. How many of you remember seeing in your history books or maybe in the encyclopedias about the Great Depression and World War I right here on this soil how people were having to leave? How people were having to depend on one another for their very survival. Oh, not just from protection but for food. For means. Friends, we need to know, are we ready? Preacher, you've been preaching that ever since you've been here, and I'll continue preaching it. Because, my friends, I believe God's Word. I believe God's Word. If Jesus says that famines and pestilence is coming, and it's only going to get worse, you can mark your calendar, and check it off on your little box. Famines and pestilence is coming. Earthquakes in various places. And it don't mean that we're going to get to check out before those things. Because Jesus says all these things are only the beginnings of sorrows. So what are we the church to be doing? What are we the church to be doing in this time? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Are we doing enough of what we're supposed to be doing? Or are we found going about life as usual, doing what we want to do, and really not giving much thought to what Jesus says? If you will, stand with me in reverence to the reading and the hearing of God's Word. I'm reading out of the New King James this morning. Matthew chapter number 28, beginning in, ver beginning in verse number 16. Man, there's a verse of Scripture right here that absolutely dumbfounded me. Can't tell you how many times I've read it. Probably can't tell you how many times I've quoted it. But as I was preparing for this message, the Lord really just wow. He wowed me. Verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. 
but some doubted. If you'll give me just a moment, I, I, want, to, I want to set the context here. Jesus Christ has been beaten beyond recognition. Crown of, crown, crown of thorns placed on his head. He's carried that beam two and a half miles out of Jerusalem. He's nailed to the cross. He's died for your and my sin. Died for the sin of the world. Died to take away that which we can't get rid of, our sin nature, and to give us that which we cannot attain on our own, his righteousness. Jesus Christ had entered the grave, and three days later, Jesus Christ had risen from the grave. For 40 days, he had appeared at different times to these disciples and to others. Paul says over 500 people saw him. My friends, all of this has happened over the course of 40 days. People had seen Jesus, People had heard Jesus talk after the resurrection. People had seen Jesus cook breakfast on the beach and feed his disciples. All of this, and now here is Jesus. He is on the top of the mountain, there <clears throat> on top of the mountain, and Jesus has those around him who had followed him. They have seen all of this happen. And some worshiped, but some still doubted. That absolutely floored me. It absolutely floored me because this is people, the ones who doubted are from among the ones who had walked with Jesus. Let's go on. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And Bob, that doesn't mean that we don't get on airplanes. Acts chapter number four. I mean, excuse me, Acts chapter number one, verse number four. Acts chapter number one, verse number four. Again, here we are on top of the mountain, right before Jesus' ascension. And being assembled together with them, Jesus being assembled together with them, some were worshiping Jesus and some were doubting. Man, to doubt Jesus at that point in time meant that they were doubting his sovereignty. To doubt Jesus at that point in time means that they had doubted that they were doubting his authority. To doubt Jesus at that point in time means that they doubted his superintended plan and purpose. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he, Jesus Christ, the Lord said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his authority, but that means here's what you're to be doing. Don't be overly concerned about that. Oh, yes, we sing, and our hearts are lifted up because we know the time's coming. But don't be overly occupied. For I got something for you to do, Jesus is about to say. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Father, today, Lord, I pray that you open our hearts 
as you opened the hearts of the disciples in Luke chapter number 24. And Lord, you clear away any of these worldly cobwebs that are clouding our hearts and our minds, disrupting our souls, and Lord, guide our attention on the things of this world when your word teaches us to set our focus and our sights and our attention on the things of heaven. Father, I pray today that you will clear away and open up the understanding of what it means to be the church. And Father, to, as you've allowed me to, to put into this context, Lord, to see some keys here that unlock the appointed work for those who are assembled to worship you. Father, today you direct and guide this word in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Whether it be in times of suffering or in times of joy, whether it be in times of war or in times of peace, whether it be, <clears throat> whether, whether it be any of these things, what are the keys that unlock Jesus' command of what you and I, the church, are to be doing. First key I'd like to, and this is just really very simple. The first key that I would like to unlock, and it's coming straight from this scripture, the first key that, uh, that we need to use to unlock is keeping the appointment. Keep your appointments. Keep your appointments. What do you mean, preacher, keep your appointments? Well, you know, it says here that when the 11 disciples went went away to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. They had to go and meet that appointment. They had to fulfill what Jesus had called for them to do. And being assembled together with them. And being assembled. They were all together. They had to meet that appointment. You know, when we, got a, when we have an ailment, what do we do? We call it, we make an appointment with the doctor. When we have a financial matter that needs to be addressed, we might call up and call a bank financial officer or maybe a CPA. When it's time to redo the will, we call up the lawyer and we redo the will. When it's time to update our insurance policies, we call the agent and have him make an appointment for him to come over. Yet when it comes to our spiritual lives, do we really consider the appointments that God the Father has made for us individually in his church corporately? Keeping the appointment is the key that unlocks our ability to listen to God's appointed will. Jesus gave them his appointed will. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. You know, when you go to the doctor, when you go to the doctor, you don't go with the mindset, well, I'm not even going to listen to what that doctor says. I don't care what his diagnosis is. I ain't going to do a thing. He says, I'm me to. well, that would be a waste of time and money, wouldn't it? That wouldn't make very good sense. It wouldn't be very wise into taking care of your own health. So when it comes to our spiritual health and our relationship with God the Father, why do we not listen to the appointments that come our way by way of the Holy Spirit through God's Word? When the Holy Spirit is speaking to you through God's Word, sometimes we have to wonder, or I have to wonder, do we truly know and recognize His voice as Jesus said in John chapter number 10? And when He brings out His own sheep, He goes before them and the sheep follow Him for they know His voice. My sheep hear my voice and know them, and I know them and they follow me. If you have not developed a spiritual ability to hear and to recognize God's voice when he speaks to you, how can you keep the appointments he's giving you? You know, I want to challenge each and every one of us that, man, I'm going to tell you, in this time, day and time in this world in which we're living, that we all begin praying. Even if you say, well, Lord, I, uh, preacher, I, I hear the Lord's voice. My friends, I think each and every one of us can hear the Lord's voice a little more. So let us all begin praying that God will enlighten us to recognize His voice 
in our lives. And then listen to what it is he's speaking to us. The key of keeping your appointments will unlock your ability to listen and to know God's will. It also unlocks your ability to follow God's appointed way. Well, preacher, what do you mean follow God's appointed way? Let's go through the Old Testament. One of the Old Testament characters or, or persons in the Old Testament, Jacob. Now, Jacob, we know, had left and he had gone up and stayed with his uncle Laban in, um, up in the region of what today would be called Syria after he had left his family, after he had ran away from his brother Esau. God had spoken to Jacob after a period of time that Jacob had been there and told him it's time for you to return to the promised land and to take all of your family with you. And you know what? Jacob followed God's will. He listened. He heard God's will and he fulfilled God's will. And he started out and he made his way with all of his family back down to the promised land. But then Jacob didn't follow God's way in his will. And because Jacob didn't follow God's way in his will, now he was fulfilling God's will. He was doing what God's will said. He was going back, but he wasn't doing it the way God told him to do it. And because of that, Jacob's daughter was raped. After that, Jacob didn't fulfill his fatherly duties in accordance with God's way in regards to two of his sons, Levi and Simeon. This allowed them to do what? To act out in their anger. And they went and they completely, brutally massacred all the men in a village where his daughter had been raped. All of this happened to Jacob and his family because he ignored the Lord's way. He was following the Lord's will. He was doing what the Lord's will, but he wasn't doing it God's way. You know, there's a proverb that tells us that in everything that we do, seek the Lord's way. Let Him guide our steps. Let Him guide our steps. Because if we don't, we will do just like Jacob. We will go out and we will, we will kind of instigate and, and, and work out things and we'll run scenarios in our own mind. Well, maybe this is what I need to do or this is what I need to do. And we'll try to figure things out and we'll act in according to our own understanding. Jacob was to simply go back and trust God and just go back home. That's what God had told him to do. Are we as individuals children of God and collectively as the body of Christ Jesus listening to God's will and are we seeking to know not only God's will but His direction, His way in which we are to go? Or do we see God's will and say, okay, well, this is what God wants us to do. Well, this, I, I'm going to do it this way. And we lean on our own understanding. It is possible to fulfill God's will, but not follow God's way, neglecting His direction. So, as we keep the appointments that open up the work for those who are assembled to worship. We need to know God's will and we need to follow God's appointed way. And then we need to adore adoration in the Lord's presence. Lift up adoration. Adore the Lord. When they saw Him, what did they do? They worshiped Him. They worshiped Him. I've already talked about those that doubted, and I, I'm not going there anymore. I've already, I'm going to tell you, you need to get a hold of that. What I shared with you earlier as we were reading the Scripture. How in the world could they doubt? When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. You know, there are many things in your and my lives that we adore. Many things that we adore. For me, I adore my wife. I hope she adores me. I don't know sometimes. We adore our spouses, don't we? We adore our children. We adore our grandchildren. Oh, for some, they adore their houses and they adore their yards and they adore their cars and they adore their hobbies and they adore all of those other extracurricular activities 
that they find in their lives. Now, preacher, what do you mean that they adore those things? I can tell you how you know that they adore those things. It's very simple. Because they spend or we spend our time, our energy, and our money making sure that the care for those things is done to the best of our ability. That represents that we adore those things. The keys that unlock the work require us to meet the appointments through listening to his will and knowing his way. But just as it was for the disciples, we must first adore Jesus Christ. Do you adore? I mean, do you adore? Or have you fallen in love? Are you in an intimate relationship with Jesus to where when you feel his closeness that you find yourself before him, before him in adoration and worship and love for who he is. If you do not adore and worship Jesus as Lord and Savior, I can tell you this, you will never ever be interested in knowing His will. And you will never find yourselves following His way or His direction if you do not adore Jesus. Why are there born again children of God today who are not in the house of God today worshiping the Lord? And I'm not talking about those who may be at work. I ain't talking about those who may be sick. I ain't talking about those who may have family emergencies. I'm talking about those sitting on the river, at the beach, or whatever, and did not take it or consider it an important enough time to come and worship the Lord. You want me to tell you why? They don't adore Jesus Christ. They haven't fallen in love with Jesus Christ because he first fell in love with them before the creation of this world. They don't understand that he, at, before the creation of this world, already had hit them in his mind. and He already knew that he was going to that cross to die for their sins, to save them from a devil's hell, to set them free from the sin that is so wrapped up around them right now. Oh, they think they're happy, but they're as miserable as miserable can be. Why? They don't adore the Lord. The disciples' worship was influenced in two ways. They realized Jesus' presence with them. Many of God's children today, they never give a thought of the presence of Christ Jesus in their lives. Uh, uh, can, you, can you really name a time? I want you to think, and, and I'm, not, I'm not downgrading this one. I just want you to think about it. Man, we get so caught up in life. We get so caught up in the things that are going on. We get so caught up in all the things that are happening. We get so caught up in, in taking our family here and taking our family there and doing this and doing that and chasing youngins this way and chasing youngins that way and doing all the things that go on in this life. Can you really identify the last time that you were literally and truly stopped in your tracks because all of a sudden you just realized the presence of Jesus Christ around you? Just think about those, those disciples and those who were with them in the upper room in that time when Jesus just, all of a sudden, the doors were shut, the doors were bolted down, and all of a sudden, whew, there was Jesus. When's the last time you really had that moment that you just recognized, oh my, Jesus' presence. You see, my friends, he still does that. He still does that. He still loves you enough that he wants you to know and to recognize and to feel his presence. Bang! Just like that. There he is. And you, oh, and you stop. You can't help but stop and just worship and take a moment 
to praise Him. My friends, when you and I allow His presence to so move us to worship Him, it will lead us to realize Jesus' love for others. Oh, when that all of a sudden, that moment happens to you, you recognize, you realize, wow, that love is not only for me, that love is for others. And you'll not hesitate to open your lives to others who may not understand, those others who may doubt, those others who may not even have a relationship with Jesus, as I, Jesus at all. And you and I, we're to allow that worship, that adoration of Jesus to be that witness of Jesus to the world around us. We as the church, uh, we seem to have misconstrued and misunderstood exactly what Jesus said in Acts chapter number one, verse number eight. Uh, we tend to think Jesus says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will go and be my witness. But that is not what Jesus says, is it? That is not what he says. Let's look and see what he says. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come, has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. It's a big difference. Not that you will go and be witnesses. You will be witnesses. What's that mean, preacher? What are you talking about, preacher? We can couple that together with Matthew chapter number 28, verse 19, when Jesus says, go and make disciples. Jesus is saying, as you go, as you go, your life will be a witness. As you're going through the everyday, your life will be a witness. As you conduct yourselves as one filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in the, before others, you shall be my witness. Why? Because they look at your life and they see a smile on your face when they know your mama just died. They see a smile on your face when they know that you've got a child deathly sick. They see a smile on your face and adoration and praise in your heart when they know what's going on in your lives and they can't understand how, how. And it is then that you're a witness. It is then that as you go, your life is a witness. Your life will lead them to question. And when they lead, when, the, when your life being power, empowered with the Holy Spirit leads them to question, that same power of the Holy Spirit will lead you to answer them with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Next, Jesus' authority is recognized. Jesus' authority is recognized. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And in Acts chapter number one, it says, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. My friends, the master key to the successful missionary work of the church in the local community is the authority of Christ Jesus recognized. It's not the salvation needs of the lost. It's not the physical healing of those who are sick. It's not the financial or hunger needs of the poor. It is the authority of Jesus Christ, His sovereignty, his superintendents recognized, acknowledged, adored, and worshiped. We tend to look at a missionary work in the context of we set up the plan and then we say, okay, Lord, how about come help us out? But Jesus made it really plain right here, didn't he? He made it really plain and he said it very sternly to set us straight as to who has the absolute sovereignty and superior authority over everything. Christ has been given all authority in heaven. Listen, my friends. Paul said it this way. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, the sovereignty, the superintendence over all things. He is preeminent. And my friends, that includes you and me and this church. What else can it mean? What else can it mean that Jesus has all authority, that Jesus is preeminent, that Jesus is completely and all sovereign, that Jesus has all superintendence at his beck and call than this? that he has the right to use his power, his authority, his sovereignty at his discretion. We got to get a hold of that. We got to understand that. It will change the direction and how you live when you understand the sovereignty of God the Father through Jesus Christ the Lord by way of the Holy Spirit indwelling our lives, that authority, that sovereignty over our lives. You see, it is in that same sovereign authority that God the Father through Jesus Christ created all the angels including one. The one that's in Isaiah called Lucifer, whom we know today to be Satan. God created him. And man, you step back and say, Lord, why in the world did you do that? In our, in our thoughts, Lord, that wasn't smart. And, you know, that third of all the angels, well, good gracious, we don't know how many that number is. They followed this one. But God created him. But you see, it is in that same sovereign authority and power that God the Father has control of Satan. Satan doesn't even control himself. Therefore, you and I, the child of God, should understand something. Satan has no authority over you or me. But in that same understanding, we, uh, we are to understand that God the Father has all sovereign authority over us to use us, call us, and direct us according to his purpose and his plan. Matthew made it abundantly clear that Jesus possesses all authority. But yet we see in Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, that some doubted. They saw his authority. They lived alongside his authority. They went to sleep with his authority. They woke up with his authority. They ate with his authority. They, listen, they did everything alongside Jesus, yet it says that some still doubted. And it's the same in the church today. We still have those who doubt the sovereign authority of Jesus Christ over our lives. And because of that, we have a struggle to do the work. It's no different than when Jesus entered into Nazareth. And because of the people's faithful unbelief, because they did not acknowledge, they doubted the sovereign authority of Jesus Christ. He was not able to work among them, but to do only a few little minute miracles. They wouldn't even hear his word. It doesn't say anything about him teaching and preaching in Nazareth. It will happen that way in the local church when there are doubts. When people don't acknowledge and recognize and identify with and receive his authority. And that brings us to the next point. Jesus' authorization is to be humbly received. You see, Jesus, it says there that Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that power 
I'm going to authorize you. My authorization is going to come on you. My power is going to come on you. You are being filled with my Holy Spirit. And the, just as Jesus taught in John, in John chapter 14, I believe it, the things that I do, those things you will do also even greater things because I have returned to the Father and the Holy Spirit has come to you through his obedience to the Father. Jesus surrendered himself to be the only pure sacrifice that once for all removes our sin. And because of that, Jesus won the authority over our lives. And this mandate that Jesus gives us in Matthew chapter number 28 to go, as I said earlier, means as you are going. It is not a mandate that you are to go in your own abilities, but you are to receive humbly His authorization to go in His authority. What does that mean, preacher? What, what are you trying to tell us? What are you trying to say? What are we to be doing? Here it is. And since Jesus has authorized you according to His authority, you can obey Him without fear. You can step out in Jesus' authority. Doesn't mean that you go up there and berate somebody over the head. No. You go in Jesus' authority with humbleness and kindness, humility and faith. As you're going about life, you can obey Him without fear. As you're going through, throughout life with His authority, having been authorized by Him, having received His power, obey Him no matter where He leads. Oh my goodness. You know, they said, Noel and the baby are stateside right now. But can you imagine her feelings for Sky? Those, the friends of Jason McCaskill, the other missionaries that we have mentioned. Paul, Paul, the missionary that, from Moldova that we know. And, and Oleg, and I'm sure some of his family, he's in Canada, Dale will tell me, but he's got family over there. That's where he's from, is from that region. No matter where he leads. As I shared with these parents the other week, when they brought their children and they brought their children to be brought back to the Lord, to be given back to the Lord. A dedication service, as we call it. Uh, to do that means that you, move your, you remove your hands from that child and wherever God leads them, you say, Lord, I trust you will. I trust your sovereignty. Listen, you can obey him no matter what circumstances you face. You can obey him knowing that he alone is the only authority. Jesus simply says to you and me, to the church, as you are going, go in my authority. Teach in my authority. Heal in my authority. Preach in my authority. Meet needs in my authority. Visit the sick in my authority. Clothe the naked in my authority. Visit the prisoners in my authority. The very nature of God the Father's design for the church, His body of believers, demands that Christianity be His missionary work that is achieved through our faith to believe, to trust, and to worship and not doubt His sovereign will and His sovereign way. And to do that as we're going. Lastly, lastly, the final key that unlocks the assigned work for those who have assembled to worship is the key of administration of Jesus' authority to all, to all. Look what it says. And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Look at verse number 8 again, the last part of verse number 8. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the world, to the end of the earth. Our concern cannot be for the Father's will. Why is that? Because that's His will. That's His will. His will is set. His will is absolute. His will is sovereign. Nothing changes God's will. Our concern cannot be the Father's will. Our concern cannot be 
His will's direction, His will's way. Therefore, He authorizes the direction, the way His will is to be carried out. That's what we're to seek. Lord, how are we to go? As we're going, Lord, keep me mindful to see opportunities. Lord, keep me mindful of the steps that I'm taking. Lord, keep me mindful of the way that I'm leaving. Lord, keep me mindful of what my life is representing. Is my life glorifying you? Is my life honoring you? The key to the Christian administration is to teach and to train all in whom we have contact to know God's standard, to know God's word, and to teach them the how important and utmost it is in our lives that we obey God's word as the only authority. This term disciple or Christian, I want to give us a, another way of looking at that word to help us understand who we are. And it would be better seen in the term apprentice. What do you mean the term apprentice, preacher? A disciple is much like the apprentice. What does the apprentice do? He attaches himself or herself to the teacher. A disciple, an apprentice, assumes the identity of the teacher. Didn't know if I was going to use this illustration or not. I'm kind of a Pirates of the Caribbean fan. You know, I, I like those movies. I don't know if y'all remember the very first movie, but when Will made the sword himself, but he was under the apprenticeship of the master, and he brought the sword to the king. And the, what did the king say? The king said, give your master my thanks and regards for the sword. But who had made the sword? Will had. And Will did not take ownership of making that sword. He aligned himself with I will, I will give. That's the way. That's an idea. That's an illustration of how we're to be. We are to align ourselves as apprentices, as disciples, as learners, students under Jesus Christ. Receiving, aligning ourselves with his authority, knowing that he has given us that authority. But it is in our faith and our trust to let him have our lives, to worship him, to adore him, that we receive that. Yet some doubted. Did they receive it? No. There's a differentiation there for a purpose. And they worshiped him, but some doubted. They had not poured themselves and aligned themselves and allowed themselves to be an apprentice who is in the very image of Jesus. As we move on, I want us to realize that in many ways the church has departed from this pattern. In so many churches and congregations today, the mindset has been developed that we hire and pay the pastor to go out and to, to preach to the lost and win the lost and to build up the saved. And, and, and the church members sit on the sign and they're good cheerleaders if they've got any enthusiasm at all. They're spectators. The lost are brought into the church uh, and brought to salvation. They're baptized and, and, and given the right hand of fellowship by the church. And then what do they do? They go and they join the other spectators. That happens so often in the church today. Why? Because we're not discipling. We're not teaching. We're not making disciples. My friends, that's not Jesus' way and it's not Jesus' charge to the church. It is not the pastor's place alone to make disciples. It is the responsibility of the entire body of Christ if in fact that is who we or any other fellowship is. Can you just imagine how quickly the church grows and how much more the church is filled with joy when every member of Christ Jesus' body is following these teachings that I've shared with you this morning and how it, how it changes the entire dynamic of the church. How folks, they will, they will look and say, well, what's going on at the church before they make their life's plan?
Can I be honest? Do we not make our last plans? And then when an event is scheduled, oh, well, you know, I, I made plans for that week. I ain't going to be able to be there. Guys, I mean, you know, why? There's got to be a love for Jesus Christ, an adoration for Jesus Christ, you know, which leads to an adoration and a love one for another. The only way a local church can be fruitful and multiply is when we apply these keys administrative keys, adoration, our love, keeping appointments, fulfilling our fulfilling what we said we will do, keeping our positions in the church, maintaining them when it's our responsibility. When we were asked, we put our name on the line. Yes, we will do that. When it's that appointed time, when it's, do it. That's the only way that we can grow and be fruitful and multiply. In Luke chapter number 24, verse 44 through, 44 through 45, Jesus said to the disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. My friends, the scriptures have not changed. The scriptures are of no private interpretation to any one person. What Jesus Christ said is what Jesus Christ meant. What God said in his word in the Old Testament is what God meant. What the Holy Spirit spoke through Peter, Paul, Timothy, any of the other, or not Timothy, but any of the others, Mark, Matthew, Luke, what the Holy Spirit spoke through them as God's word is what he meant. And it's of no private interpretation. Friends, I, I just want to share with you this morning. And there's much work to be done. There is much work to be, be done. And it begins with the salvation of those in this community. There's vision. If you're listening and if you're paying attention, there's vision coming in many different directions. More vision than any one person, than any small group can, can handle and, and perform the task to complete. It takes all of us, every single one of us. And it takes a three-part effort on all of us. And that three-part effort is this. Christ's authority as the head of the church. Christ's authority is the head of the church church, giving that authorization for the pastor to lead the flock, the congregation, to understand the word and to follow that authority. The first and most important work, as I've already said, is being a witness of Jesus to the lost and making disciples. So today, the challenge from Jesus is word. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we prepared to meet this work? Are we ready? Are we prepared? Have we assembled to truly worship? Or did we walk in here with doubts? Did we walk in here with everything else that's going on in our lives, on our minds, to the point that it has stifled us that worship's really not the reason we showed up. We just showed up because that's what we're supposed to do. You see, there's an assigned work. But that assigned work, just as we've seen in Matthew, chapter number 28, verse number 17, that assigned work is given to those who had assembled for worship. The doubters, unless their hearts were changed, went on down. And they just meandered through life trying to appease the Father. Well, Lord, now, you know, I'll do this. Listen, guys, I done been there. I have been there trying to make deals with the Lord. Now, Lord, I, I'll do this, but I ain't doing that. 
and I'll do this, but I ain't doing that. Mm, it don't work that way. It don't work that way. Let us come before the Lord. Lord, forgive me for allowing my life to become so full of the world's way, so full of my personal desires that I have ignored your command, that I have ignored your sovereign, superintended authority over my life to go out and as I am going to be your witness just in the way I live and to make disciples, teaching and training those whom I come in contact with about the ways of Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, today I thank you for your word. Father, today I pray. The Lord, your word was clear. I pray, Lord. Lord, I know that I'm, I'm not the best of speakers, Lord. Lord, I just believe your word. And I try to share it. Father, I pray that, Lord, that folks would have, have not listened to me today. But they've listened to the Holy Spirit as He brought the Word into the heart. Father, I pray today that You would move in the hearts of people as only You can. Father, I pray, Lord, You would challenge each and every one of us to realize that Lord, more than ever in our lifetimes do we need to truly be about being who you have called us to be in your authority as your church. In Jesus' name, amen.